everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods and another ZL1 1LE video. As promised in the last video, I said that something showed up the day we were getting it track aligned. So hopefully we're gonna get it installed in this video and we're eventually gonna hit some weather that we can actually go out and finally break in these brake pads and give you guys an overall uh, review on how this thing feels uh, with a track day set up suspension wise, uh, even though it is street driven. All right, so I already did an unboxing here and uh, unfortunately I deleted all the footage. So we're just gonna have to basically start from scratch. And as you can see, we got some exhaust parts. Now, I do wanna say one thing and I'm probably gonna get some huge hate for this, but uh, I'm doing it for the channel. I'm doing it just to put a little bit of a smile on my face. But uh, guys, I am not a muscle car fan. Uh, what I mean by that is I am not in love with the way American muscle cars sound. I know I'm gonna get huge hate for that, but hear me out. There is just a night and day difference with exhausts and it's due to the fact of how the engine is built. So if you look at most American muscle cars, I think it has to come down with the way the firing order is of the uh, spark plugs in each cylinder and how the crank is made and how they actually fire. So most American muscle cars use a cross plane crankshaft. And again, it has to do with when it rotates um, and how the firing order goes off. It really just doesn't have a great sound to me. Um, it's that American low, like, and that just doesn't sound great to me, as opposed to a higher revving uh, European type V8 engine, which uses a flat plane crankshaft, which I believe is a much more expensive way to make a crankshaft. It again, also gets you a higher revving because it's a better made engine or orientation of the engine. And a perfect example is that is the first Z06 that is coming out in the new C8. It uses a flat plane crank, it's high revving. It has almost freaking 700 horsepower out of a naturally aspirated V8. That is the highest horsepower ever made in the V8 engine. This has 650, but it's supercharged at like 12 or 15 pounds of boost, and it still doesn't even make the horsepower that the new C8 Z06 is gonna have. So clearly there's a difference in the manufacturing of an engine uh, between that cross plane and flat plane that just is gonna be a better engine in my opinion. Um, I absolutely love the way Ferraris and Lamborghinis sound even though yes, most of them can be V8s, 10s, 12s, etc. But uh, it's just that real, real high revving, high pitch sound that just sounds so exotic and uh, sounds great to me. So again, you'll probably all hate me for it, but uh, either way, for you guys in the channel, we'll give you some of that low grumble out of an American V8 and we're gonna install this exhaust and just go at it. So what we ended up picking up was an MBRP exhaust from Canada. The reason why I got this, I'll be honest with you, impulse buy. Uh, I wanted something, I wanted a little bit more grunt and sound. Again, it may not be the tone that I love, but I wanted something to give me a little bit more sound. So what I got here was they make a couple exhausts for uh, MBRP and they make like an axle back and they make a full cap back exhaust. And to me, the axle back made no sense. It's like $200 difference between the axle back and the full exhaust. Why the hell wouldn't you just get the full exhaust? If anything, the axle back should be two or $300 cheaper or the full exhaust should be two or $300 more expensive. So to be so close in price, just get the whole thing and be done with it. Now, this exhaust is not the greatest of exhausts. Uh, I don't think there's anything that I personally have to worry about because this is not gonna be a winter driven car, but the it, it's cheap, it is dirt cheap. It is the cheapest exhaust that you can make and that is because the steel that they use for this exhaust is absolute junk cheap 
mild steel with an aluminized coating. The aluminized coating is supposed to make it last longer, but as you can see from this true X pipe, you've got welding right in there that's just absolutely gonna rust in no time. It's gonna pit and look like crap, and hopefully it, it holds up again. We're not driving this thing in the winter, so we really shouldn't be beating it up that bad. But uh, at least the back is coated in some sort of black high temp paint, so that will keep it looking uh, pretty. And really, all we're ever gonna be seeing is those exhaust tips. And if I'm not mistaken, most exhaust, exhaust tips at least come stainless steel. So even if that black is hurt somehow, uh, the stainless steel tip under there should make it last for pretty much forever. But uh, it's not a bad made exhaust. Um, the reviews are great. The fitment should be great. The install should be very easy. Um, so it is a well-made exhaust from the manufacturer. But uh, again, just really on the cheap side because it's not stainless steel. But uh, we are going up to three inches from I think maybe two and a half or two and three quarter inches. So we're definitely gonna get a little bit more airflow and probably a little bit louder of a sound. But the beauty that I went with this exhaust system is because of one thing that actually adds power or makes you not lose power. So let me tell you what I'm talking about. So exhaust systems can be poorly made or they can have a whole bunch of R&D behind them. Obviously doing more R&D is just gonna make the price of the exhaust go up. So one kind of cheater mod that I think that you can get away with with an exhaust system is basically adding one of those guys. What that is, is it's called a Hemholtz resonator. It has several reasons behind it. And it's not that a Hemholtz resonator will add horsepower to an exhaust system, but it can help make up for a possible loss of an exhaust system if it's poorly made. And what I mean by that is people all the time from, you know, ever since I was a teenager back in the 90s, people are always like, oh, you can't put an exhaust on a car like that. You're gonna lose back pressure. It's all about back pressure. That couldn't be further from the truth. There's no such thing as back pressure. Exhaust systems need to be properly made so that they have something called a proper scavenging effect. What that basically means is as the exhaust uh, valves open and close in every cylinder and that exhaust fume or pulse is going down the exhaust system, it pulses like open, close, open, close, open, close, kind of like that as it goes on down. If your scavenging effect is poorly made, where you don't have an X pipe, where your headers are unequal length, you're gonna have that Subaru boxer rumble where that unequal length header just gives you that blah, 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 or that blah, 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 blah. And that's an efficient way to make an exhaust system. You're not gonna have a good scavenging effect if your exhaust is all smashing at one location and you cannot get the fumes out of the exhaust fast enough. Again, it's not about back pressure. If you can make an exhaust system six inches in diameter and be like, oh my God, that is way too big. But if the exhausts are going out, the scavenging effect is going out the exhaust as fast as possible, you're actually not gonna lose any horsepower. You need to get the exhaust fumes out of the exhaust as fast as humanly possible. So by going too big or too small isn't really the case, it's if you can get it to flow out because not only are the pistons driving the exhaust fumes up, the exhaust valves open and then it's forcing it out of the head, but you also want the exhaust system to act like a vacuum effect and suck the exhaust out of the head and push it out the uh, tailpipe. If you can have that scavenging effect act properly, and you don't have uh, misses where you've got an exhaust over here and then over here, you got this big gap in the middle, that's where you're gonna lose power, that's where you're gonna get that boxer rumble, that's where you're gonna get maybe a V8 grumble, and you're not gonna have that exhaust go out quickly enough. So where the Hemholtz comes in is it acts like a stored air chamber. Obviously you got fumes going that out, down that exhaust, it goes into this resonator here that is completely capped off. And when you have that misalignment or that gap in air from the pulses, it almost pushes air back in with that negative pressure effect, filling that gap where air should be. And you keep your scavenging effect going up and very fast. 
So it's basically like adding horsepower, but not really. It's just you're not losing horsepower because that's going to fill in some gaps where there may be one. That's going to completely also change the sound too. So another uh, bonus of a Hemholtz is you really cut down on any nasty raspiness in an exhaust because you don't have that chance for that rasp to occur because you're basically adding some extra exhaust in as it gets stored and bottled up inside of that bottle resonator, which technically isn't a bottle resonator, it's a, it's a hem hole. It's a bottle resonator is just which, when you see one of those resonators like cut into an exhaust system and it's just a straight through glass pack resonator that on the inside it's straight through design, but there's little tiny holes that go up. The exhaust can go up through those holes, go around in some glass pack like fiberglass material, then re-exit and enter the exhaust system. That helps a little bit with rasp but nowhere near as much as what a Hemholtz can do. The third benefit of a Hemholtz is they help stop drone. If you guys don't know what drone is, roll down a window halfway in a car or truck, and then you hear that loud like and you feels like your head's gonna explode. That's kind of like an air drone almost, just from airflow. But now do that with an exhaust system and you actually hear an exhaust note drone. It absolutely just drives you nuts. It feels like it's a hundred times louder than what it is and you feel like your head's gonna explode. Hemholtz added into an exhaust system and there's online calculators for this that if you have a drone at certain RPM, say 2,500 RPM to 2,900 RPM and that's where your drone is at its worst, if you go online and look at a Hemholtz calculator, they will calculate the size of the pipe you need, the diameter, and the length that you need. And you don't have to make it out of a bottle like that. You can make it just out of like a two inch piece of pipe. But if you do all two inch pipe, you're gonna have to make it much longer than what you'll actually need. So again, let's say the calculator says you have this horrible drone, it sounds terrible, your head's gonna explode from 25 to 2900 RPM. Add a two inch piece of pipe, 28 inches long, block it off, that'll stop your drone. That is really the point of a Hemholtz. It's just the added benefit to also cut down on RAF and to cut down, uh, to help with that scavenging effect to get those fumes out as fast as possible. So hang tight, we'll get started here and uh, hope you guys enjoy this one. Well, the beauty about country L-I-V-I-N is the fact that our roads are 55 miles an hour. So with the factory brake pads, we can break this thing in per GM specs and we got to find some decent roads that we can do 60 miles an hour uh, so we're only speeding five miles an hour not a big deal cop ain't even gonna pull you over for five over 60 miles an hour down to 15 immediately back up to 60 15 60 15 60 15 and they want me to do that 23 times and apparently after that they say the factory brake pads are broken in uh, it's not exactly the way that I always break in pads. I usually just do 60-10, 60-10, and then I give it a second, and then I start doing 80-10, 80-10, but that's with racing brake pads. So these are not racing brake pads. They're still street-driven pads. So a difference, for example, is the Carbotech pads that I want to go with. Those are probably going to be the XP20s. They have an initial bite temperature at 610 degrees Fahrenheit, but they go all the way up to like 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So quite a big difference in what the factory are, because just for an example, the XP10s or the XP12s, they've got an additional bite at about 175 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're going from 175 to be able to stop up to 610 to stop. So that clearly needs to get up to like 80 miles an hour to start breaking those pads in, as opposed to these factory pads, they're probably not even at 175. They're probably under 100 degrees Fahrenheit for their initial bite. But then that also means their top max temperature is probably Probably only maybe like 1500 degrees instead of 2500 degrees so should be a lot easier to break these in and we can at least bed the pad material into the rotors and uh, that should turn the rotors blue today uh, or gray purple just crazy effect you guys have seen in the past the rotors right now are just like a mirror finish we need to get those like nasty gray blue purple heat synced in to start putting in some pad in there so uh, I don't know. Let, let's try the Chevy way right now. Let's do 60, 15, 60, 15, 23 times. And then we've got to go for a good 10 miles or 10 minutes or more 
and not touch the brake pads at all. So I'm gonna have to try and find a highway or finish my 6010s or 6015s near a highway so I can roll right on. Or if we stay out in the country, most of our stop signs, you know, you can see in each direction, like 100 miles that you can kind of just roll through and not get in trouble. Uh, again, do this in Mexico, do this where it's safe. I live out in the country, there's no drivers ever out here. So I, I can pretty much do that, but uh, we just need to find the right road to do it on. So uh, I don't know, wish me luck, hang tight, here we go. All right, so tires are up to temp, oil's up to temp, transmission fluid's up to temp. I really wish the oil and the transmission had better notches than what they do. They're just giving you numbers for 100, 200, and 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it doesn't even look like it turns red on the oil until about 300 or like 280 degrees. I wish that was down a little bit or the numbers could blow up or you could get more of an uh, indication on what you're in there. But uh, I know that it's warm enough because they're, they're not increasing anymore and the tires are up to normal operating temperature. Right now I just need to find my perfect road where basically I can do like right handers and look what's coming from the left and just keep going right, right, right. Uh, the roads are 55 miles an hour, like I said. So that way we're not really speeding and uh, just need to make sure no one's behind me so I can slam onto my brakes and get down to about 15 and right back up. Uh, I am gonna put it in automatic and just let the car do it. So I'm not going too aggressive on the transmission, trying to shift all the time, but uh, Let's keep looking for one more perfect road and then I think we will start this process. All right, so I'm headed around for another loop. Uh, I tried doing it in track mode. This is the first time I actually had it in track mode. Way too aggressive. Uh, it does not want to shift and then when you slam on the brakes and try and get back up, the shifting is just terrible. So again, leaving it in automatic mode and I think I'm gonna leave it in sport mode so the shifts are a little bit more crisp and clean. Um, I'm not trying to do a burnout and like go crazy back up to 60 miles an hour, but fast enough that they don't have time to cool off. So definitely would not recommend track mode to do this. Try and do it in just sport mode. And another test there didn't work out too well either. Traction control has to be off. It is very hard to get back up and not peel out, even though you're not really pushing the gas pedal that hard because it is about 52 degrees now. So traction control off, and I think I'm back in manual mode. Uh, it's just too much start and go, start and go to be in automatic purely. So we're gonna have to be doing it ourselves with the paddles. So sport mode, paddle shifting, traction control off. And again, do not engage ABS. You're trying to be soft on the brakes, but hard enough that you're putting heat into those rotors. So I think we got the formula down, so let's try this one more time. Again, the goal here is just to try and get the brakes to fade. Oh my god, the G-force. So manual mode works just very light when you're accelerating back up. It just does not like to go back up to a hard acceleration.
can't say that I'm done done uh, I don't I didn't hit 23 there there wasn't an opportunity to do 23 on the kind of path that I took but definitely 10 or 15 in and uh, transmission temp is definitely warm uh, oil does good right now I think because transmission so hot the automatic paddle shift thing is really aggressive and it's like hitting hard I don't know if that's just cause but hopefully that's not a problem and it cools down and shifts a little bit smoother here in a minute but right now we're on our cool down basically so hopefully it'll work uh, I did have to touch the brake ever so slightly because traffic was coming when I hit a right hand stop sign and I, I was like almost going to roll through the stop sign so the the rotors are definitely still hot so we definitely got them warm enough to warm enough to basically initiate kind of a brake fade so right now we need a good 10 minutes or so of cooling these down uh, and we got a long stretch of road here that uh, it's 55 miles an hour and traffic is way up there so we should be healthy with that so the only thing that we're gonna be able to tell is by the time we get home is did we put enough heat in the rotor and are the rotors changed colors uh, fingers crossed they are and we don't have to do this again because I swear to God there's so much g-force I think my stomach was going to come out of my uh, body and make me hurl so <laughs> well uh, hopefully again fingers crossed uh, we're done here we don't have to do this again almost back home but I think I'm gonna go a little bit further uh, now that my head is kind of back on straight too I can feel my brain going back and forth in my skull Holy crap, the review of these brake pads, even with the factory pads, they are quite impressive. To be able to have a 4,000 pound car with me in it, almost a full tank of gas, to be able to continually hit that, hit that, hit that, even, again, a factory brake pad at only 60 miles an hour, um, and again, only hitting it maybe 10 or 15 times, you're gonna have to review the footage and actually see how many times I actually hit it, uh, but, that is quite impressive. I, I really never felt crazy brake fade, but I am quite impressed with the factory lines that are on there. We don't have upgraded stainless steel brake lines. They're factory rubber, so I don't know how much flex those actually have in them, being like a track edition type car with that type of rotor uh, installed. Uh, I'm really happy with the way this thing handles. I mean, you're looking at moving this thing just a half of an inch of steering wheel, and holy crap, does this thing track with that alignment? It feels absolutely awesome. It should feel awesome on the track too, but we'll have to tailor it to my style of driving again with uh, messing with the uh, alignment and everything, with, especially with the front toe to see what actually I prefer and what I actually like. Again, transmission, not the happiest in doing that. So I'm not gonna know how well the transmission does until we actually get onto a racetrack and actually feel it. It is nowhere near the AMG's dual clutch. That dual clutch really hits shifts hard and it shifts hard and bangs on those gears great. This is just more like fluid and smooth, which I don't know, it's not a bad thing, but it's just not on the realm of a dual clutch where you actually have uh, paddle shifting where it actually feels like a manual, like you're releasing that clutch and it's actually uh, really hammering in the gear. So an, an automatic torque converter, eh, I'm not in love with it but definitely not in love with doing that procedure. That The transmission does not like that, but we'll have to see what actually happens on a racetrack when we actually can uh, you know, bang up and down through the gears appropriately to uh, get them to be happy. So we'll have to wait and see on our first track day, but overall, I am impressed. The braking is freaking awesome. Uh, the, the handling right now, the suspension and everything, these tires feel amazing and I know everyone else they feel amazing too on a racetrack when you're actually doing track days. Uh, again, it'll be wait to be seen on what I actually give a full review on how this transmission feels. But if you guys are definitely looking at one of these, I recommend it. It is fun. It is good. And uh, really, there's nothing else to say until we get on the track. So I'll see you guys back home in a little bit. All right, back home, moment of truth. Did we do it? Has the rotors, rotors changed colors? 
Uh, I will tell you one thing though, again, that transmission did not really like doing that. Uh, we went from about 130 degrees Fahrenheit driving around as I was cruising back home, noticing the temperature. Uh, we got up to almost like 230 degrees Fahrenheit. So 100 degrees difference in the training temperature just for doing that over a few minutes. So uh, you manual shift guys probably won't see that much heat and abuse because you don't have that massive torque converter doing all that work. But uh, I don't know. Let me break down the camera here. And again, fingers crossed these rotors have changed colors. Well, what do you all think? Were we successful? We have definitely changed the color. Hopefully with the sun coming in the window there, you can actually see that. Uh, I'm not too thrilled about how the colors are so freaking different. Like right in here, it's very shiny still. Although you can definitely see you got temperature all the way into here, all the way out. And it's weird that, I mean, the brake pad, like kind of right there should have heated that up and it is making full contact, but uh, that is definitely kind of what we're looking for. So I wish this color was through and through all the way. Again, you still got some glossiness in here about maybe, I don't know, that's probably under three quarters of an inch, maybe five in five eighths of an inch, I would say in total that this ring right there didn't get it. But uh, that definitely got some heat in there. So maybe that's just because the brake duct cooling ducts are still on and you probably should have blocked them off before you did that. So maybe that's where the, the cold air is hitting first. So this was cooling down faster than the outer part. I don't know, I'm just spitballing here. But uh, that definitely is what we were kind of after and what we're looking for. So definitely not a chrome shininess anymore. And uh, nothing is hot right now. Everything is very cold, cool to the touch. So we're good to park the car now. So now we can change out the brake fluid. We can get our exhaust installed. And uh, I guess that's one more thing done for right now. And when our first track day comes, we'll probably hit those again harder to where they change color and to where that inner ring will probably actually uh, color change and will get hot and up to temperature. And just to check over here, this side looks a little bit better, if you can see in there. So maybe it was just a pad. This looks like a lot more like Saturn's rings. There's no real major gap in there, but we've got good color change. It's still a little shiny, so I don't know. We definitely hit it as much as we could have, at least on the street, being safe. And yeah, you've got some good color change back in there. Doesn't show up on camera too easily, but definitely all throughout here where it's definitely nice colors. So it is what it is. It'll be really good initial bite now on the street. And uh, again, hopefully that first track day within a couple laps will really feel some good braking, but uh, I'm happy with that. So let me put the tire back on and uh, we'll figure out how we can get the brakes bled and uh, get this whole exhaust put on. All right, first step, getting the exhaust on, obviously get the car up into the air. So this is the setup that I have to do, unfortunately, putting the race ramps facing that way because I've got to use this jack point here to get that tire up. And then of course, jacking the rear up by the diff and putting in my jack stands on those rear pinch welds. So it's safe, uh, it's not gonna slide off forward. Uh, so next step is we have to remove the power to the actuators uh, for the exhaust valves, which you can see are already turning color. So inside here, they're already still kind of silver, and this is the exhaust seams coming actually through the muffler. But this one I hear that's already like gold colored now. That's the one that's basically straight piped. But the actuator is simple. There's just a gray plug here that you have to push back, and then you just pull this guy right out, and that way when you drop the suitcase muffler, you're not ripping this wire out. And we're actually gonna save these actuators, bolt them up over here, so that way the car still thinks they're installed and functioning properly. And uh, that's just the first thing that we have to do. All right, step two, I am going to cut the factory muffler off here and here. I do not wanna have to deal with pulling this out as one piece. And it's just a heck of a lot easier just to hack it and be done with it. amount of weight so I said screw it cut this bracket off we can always weld it back on if this thing ever goes back on factory but 
Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I'll probably just end up pitching it. But uh, we'll save the hangers everywhere because I don't know which rubber hangers actually get used uh, if it's every single one of them because obviously there's four on this alone. But we do have to unbolt the actuators and pull them out so that way we can plug them back in. And again, MBRP gives you a little mounting bracket so you can bolt it up somewhere and it'll still be plugged in and uh, the valve can function and this like basically won't rust out or uh, get water damage. All right, so these are the brackets they give you. They are very thick steel. Uh, they just basically go back in the factory location and you can see the motor actuator can still move because they have a cutout up here. And then these holes right here, it looks like you bolt it, uh, remove two bolts that hold the lower bumper on to a little metal heat shield. So just pop those two out and you can slide this in and then put them back in and it bolts it down. And then this is almost like it's just staying in factory. The actuator screws are eight millimeter to bolt that back on. And then these little screws right here are uh, seven millimeter. And the way these ones work is it's kind of like a coarse threaded screw that goes up through the bumper. And that little kind of metal piece right there that screws it back into. The only way you're gonna be able to put this back on there is to slide the bracket so it's pinched in between here and in between the bumper. So that way it gets pinched in there and it screws and holds back down because that right there obviously is not a nut that you could put it on the back side. It just gets sent all the way up through. All right, that one is all done. It's bolted in. I did have to remove this clip right here off of that nut or threads or whatever you wanna call it to give me a little bit more room. But again, it's pinched in between here. This is all now bolted strong again. And that actuator can just sit there for the rest of its life and still function and actuate and move right here if it needed to, but nothing's really gonna hinder that or get in its way. All right, both actuators done, bolted up in place. Now we're just gonna move on down, probably cut the exhaust up maybe in one or two more pieces to get it all out. And then the only other thing, uh, word of advice, plug the actuators in first before you get them and bolt them in there so your hand can fit in there a little bit easier. But uh, again, gotta go under the car now and cut some more out or get it off as much of the hangers as we can and then try and pull the whole thing out. All right, next up, I just went ahead and removed these two 15 millimeter bolts holding the secondary cat to the primary so that way this whole thing can basically come off. On the other side, however, it's not a, uh, kind of bolt on style it's a clamp on style so there's just one on that side so just loosen that up and then i went ahead and unplugged both secondary o2 sensors here so that way what we're on to right now is when we remove this bracket here and i've already got one bolt out and two on the other side two more of those right there and i think this whole thing is only being held up by this bracket so once the bracket comes down the entire middle section all the way back to there this will all just fall straight down all right so the oem exhaust is off on the passenger side uh, I did go ahead and cut this pipe right here because we do have to cut it. The directions say how much you have to cut back on each one of these ones. Uh, back from the secondary cat, there's so many inches that you have to cut back here uh, on each side, and each side is different. I think it said 2.1 inches and 1.7 inches, but I don't know which one yet until I get back out from under here. But uh, we had to cut that anyway because these slip-on styles are really hard to get out so this is just easier uh, just to whack it off there and now the whole thing is out and we can pull it out from under the car and uh, now we can get to working on where we need to cut each one of the secondary cats before we install it back in and it goes on to those front pipes uh, right there for the uh, new exhaust and this is why these are difficult because you really have to be able to pull back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and have a lot of movement up and down to pull these back out. And uh, it's just real hard with the entire exhaust system in one piece. So uh, I'm just going to get to working on still pulling this out, which is difficult with the clamp kind of right where it is. So I got to unpinch this thing basically and uh, get this little section out. Holy crap, do I hate engineers. 
This is just absolutely a nightmare to try and be able to unpinch this gap right here out of that slip coupler like that. Almost but destroyed the clamp that goes around it to pinch this to be able to get this out. But Jesus, why the hell can't you make an exhaust like every other company where you can bolt them down just like that on each side equally and then run it back? Every other car I've dealt with, you were able to do uh, the exact same thing on each side. What a ridiculous mess. But as you can see here, you only had to unplug the one catalytic converter. This is off the passenger side. The driver's side, it's up uh, stream here, so over here. So you do not have to remove uh, or unplug it over there. But now we just need to read the directions and see where this needs cut back and to see where this side needs cut back. All right, so it's 1.7 inches on the driver and 2.1 on the passenger. Now, these lines on here don't exactly give me a good indication of are we measuring back from the weld, are we measuring back from the bump, are we measuring back when it finally gets onto the straight pipe. Uh, the line, the, that first line over there, I don't even know if you guys can see that, but the first line looks like it's almost an inch back off of all of this. So it looks like they're starting their line here and then going 1.7 back. So I guess worst case scenario, cut back as much as you can first and then you can always come back in at a later time but uh i don't know we'll give this a shot wherever i think 1.7 actually is hopefully that was right driver's side cut uh hopefully that's about an inch and a half more on like this straight section i guess which starts right about in there so not really up near the welds so about 1.7 inches going this way and then again if you look at the passenger picture they're starting that second or that very first line closest to the cat way back on, I guess, the straight section is like from right here to right here before it starts to turn. So somewhere right about in there. I've kind of already made a mark. So fingers crossed uh, this all works out. Well, like I said, hopefully this works out, but out with the old and busted and these freaking pipes that look like that. Holy crap, that is fucking strange. Now let's uh, put these back on loosely and then we can figure out which way these go. I don't know if, uh, cause they got a pretty big bow in them. I don't know if they go like that or we have to turn them over and swap sides. But uh, let's just start building this thing out and seeing if we can get seven pieces all connected and into each other. Negative one for MBRP because I think they screwed up. See how this pipe slits, slips over the factory pipe extremely easy? And then we just put a clamp on there and clamp that down. Well, they decided to, on this side, shrink this side down and it cannot go in to the other catalytic converter uh, because these are the, like the exact same size, uh, whether we're on the driver's side or the passenger side. Uh, this pipe here and their pipe here are 100% the exact same size. So I cannot slip this over this way and I can't slip the pipe onto like this side, like I'm assuming it's supposed to be with ease, like just like that. So they necked this way down. I mean, you can even see how necked down it is, but it's necked down to the exact same size of the factory pipe. So there's no way to slip this on on the passenger side. So uh, way to go guys. Um, I don't know, I gotta figure something out. I don't have a pipe extender or anything. Uh, here at the house where you could like put this in like put something in here and it kind of like pulls it back out equally um and again they're the exact same size on each side so uh scratch my head here a little bit try and install the driver's side right now and then i'll see what maybe i can come up with uh for this side okay <laughs> it is like two in the morning do i look defeated because i feel defeated it's on kinda so I still have to, this side's done. I still have to adjust this side. So at least like when you're walking up on the tips, they look darn near even, except for that outside pipe there just needs pushed in a little bit and then I need to tighten it. Everything under the exhaust seems to be going okay, fitment wise, um, but, but nothing fits. <laughs> Uh, slip fit exhausts are absolutely the worst. Just give me something that bolts together. 
uh, or V-band clamps something. Slip fits are just an absolute nightmare to try and get them to slip over because the tolerance is you just can't do it. Uh, you need like 10 hands to grab the pipe to be able to twist it and pull it and rack it and then slide it in further. Just an absolute nightmare. Uh, you have to remove the brackets back here in the back. Luckily that is a bracket back there because you can't slip the exhaust in when the bracket's like sitting still. Luckily there's just two bolts back there that you can take it off. Get all the other hangers and stuff fitted back there and then slip that bracket on last and tighten it up. But uh, it seems to look okay underneath. The only problem is, is that solution uh, that I came up with on the passenger side, connecting the mid pipe to the cat. Um, again, they just didn't open that pipe up to slit over. So I just completely cut that piece off and that gave me like that part back, was able to slip over the pipe. But of course I can't really put a V-band or a, a clamp around that to hold it tight. What I'm probably going to end up doing is um, putting the clamp on uh, because I don't think it's slid on as much as you want it to because they want you to slip the pipe over another pipe at least an inch and a half. Well, that's an inch and a half right there. So uh, I think within the mid pipe, you know, I have a little bit of movement and then there's the X pipe and then kind of the axle pipe, all of those aren't probably as deep seated as the driver's side, but they're more than an inch and a half. I'm talking some of these are slip fitted, probably almost three inches. So they're really in there. So I have room to work with, but I didn't really take a measurement on the passenger side, how much it is slipping over the cat. So I can probably put the V-band or the clamp on there for now. And then my welder's not the greatest, uh, especially when you don't like you're not off of the ground i may just take it to a muffler shop and uh, have them weld it on there so that way if it ever has to come off you just start back here take this off take off piece by piece and then uh the mid pipe will just come off with that front catalytic converter not really the end of the world that's how the stock exhaust is made and they come on and off all the time i'm sure so a nightmare but at least it's done and again, it doesn't look too bad, as I do say so myself. Everything is up off the ground. I do have to adjust the passenger pipe still, because obviously, again, it's not welded up there. I'm going to loosen up that clamp, uh, the mid pipe to the X pipe, rotate it up just a little bit, because I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it's hanging down like right about there too far. So we'll just rotate it up, um, and then hopefully that clamp can hold it somewhat to get me to a, an alignment or a muffler shop or I'll just put a tack weld on it now if I can get my welder to weld upside down because again, it's just not a great uh, welder. But everything's out of the way. It's not hitting anything. Uh, everything seems to go together uh, well. And by that, I mean like on the car where it's not hitting anything. But from, I don't know, a, a one to five of difficulty, uh, five being the worst. This is definitely a four, four and a half if you're doing it on your own. You really have to have muscle to be able to move those pipes and get them in an inch and a half or two inch or even three inch because of the tolerances. If you don't have grip strength to be able to move those in and then the axle pipe to the X pipe because of the paint, I had to, I'm sorry, the axle pipe to the uh, uh, back pipes to the tips. Uh, I had to take my grinder and take that paint off because the paint obviously takes away all of your tolerances and I couldn't even get them on more than a half of an inch. So just an absolute nightmare. Uh, again, it's probably two in the morning right now. I'm gonna spend a couple more minutes bolting everything up, make sure fitment again is good, give everything a little bit of a shake to make sure nothing's coming in contact with anything. And then uh, again, I may put that clamp on, I may throw a tack weld on it just to get me to a muffler shop or something. And then the top, of course, is probably going to leak, but uh, uh, it is what it is. What are you going to do? So um, I will give you a fire up in the morning as soon as I try and make my way to a muffler shop in the morning. So uh, we'll give you first start up then. So I'm going to play a little bit more and then get the heck out of here because holy crap, what a nightmare. Well, it's morning and I got everything bolted up last night before I went to bed. So fingers crossed. Uh, I know there's going to be a tons of leaks. I know I'm going to hear them under there. Uh, like I said before, the passenger side pipe that's made wrong. Uh, I just barely got it over top of the catalytic converter, but those clamps are about maybe an inch wider more. So if it's only like half inch or so over, I clamp the crap out of that pipe. So it shouldn't fall off. We're going to try and go down to a muffler shop right now, or actually a performance shop that I know 
to see if they can get it up on a lift, remove the clamp, and then weld it as much as they can. Or maybe a little bit more money, we could hack off those pipes on each side and maybe we can do some test pipes. Uh, if you don't know what that is, I'm not gonna explain it any further, but we can add some test pipes on here, completely seal it up, and uh, that way it's kind of all bolted in one piece and might even give us a little bit more sound. So for right now, without further ado, let's fire this thing up for the first time. Let's head on down to the shop, see what it sounds like drone-wise, rasp-wise. Uh, by the time we get over to where a highway is, hopefully we'll be able to uh, get on it and uh, the car's warmed up. So uh, again, without further ado, let's do this. Fire in the hole. Acceleration-wise, car's still cold, but uh, it's overall not bad in here. You definitely can hear it pick up. But still, that's not terrible. I'm not like losing my hearing or anything for a race exhaust uh, to not be absolutely deafening and straight piped. It doesn't sound like it's straight piped, so I think that's all thanks to the Hemholtz because again, three inch pipe, straight piped, most cars we deafening right now and uh, that's not bad at all so those freaking things are awesome that they add those on I did call the manufacturer they wanted me to send a, uh, wanted to send me a whole new pipe I said no forget it I've already cut it and it's kind of butted up next to the factory uh, catalytic converter now so I'm just gonna go ahead and weld it but I did call Summit Racing who I ordered it through and they went ahead and gave me a $50 refund, which I think they'll go back for MDRP and get their money back from them. So this $50 should take care of me going to a shop and having them weld it, so at least it won't come undone if that clamp were to ever move and uh, fall off. So fingers crossed I make it all the way down there and it doesn't fall off. I did clamp the crap out of it, but hopefully in a little bit I'll have an update to see what the game plan is, what it might actually cost, and um, if that $50 was actually worth it. All right, so one more uh, review on the highway here. We're at about 1,600 RPM. I'm in 10th uh, gear now, absolutely no drone. You can seriously drive this thing as a daily driver with this race exhaust and not hurt your ears and seriously not hurt anyone else's. It's absolutely crazy how quiet this is. So I'm just curious if I can initiate drone in any uh, RPM. So we'll go from 1600 right now, down the ninth gear, that didn't do anything. Eighth gear, I'm at 2100, no drone. I can whisper to you if I can, uh, so not bad at all. Seventh gear puts us up to about 24. No drone. Sixth gear. I'm at 3,000 RPM and I can still talk to you. Yes, I can hear the exhaust that it's loud, but there's no drone going on. So definitely a good made exhaust in the R&D that they did do with those Hemholtz added on. So if you guys are worried about a daily driver, I would not be scared about that at all on the 1LE. So I don't know if the SS being the actually aspirated would be any different, but at least with the supercharged version of this motor, 100% uh, you can daily drive for this thing. But when you kick it down in the gear and go, you're gonna go, so. shop 
exhaust. The components aren't great, but that one fitment issue, it was probably just a missed pipe that they didn't flare it out. So I can't give too much hate to MBRP for missing one little section. Well, muffler shop was unsuccessful. One couldn't even get the car on the lift and the performance shop was just too busy. So I'm either gonna have to keep my fingers crossed that it doesn't pop off and that clamp is good. Those clamps are about an inch and a half wide. So the best that we could do is maybe even if I didn't wanna weld it or attempt it with mine, uh, they do make clamps that are like three inches wide and that would fully in-house uh, that slit to where it's kinda like over top of it and it would at least not allow it to fall off. But I think chances are pretty good it's not gonna fall off because it is pretty tight in there. The tips can't like push themselves backwards towards the back of the car to where that can happen. So I don't know, it is what it is. So for night right now, I think I'm just gonna leave it there and uh, call this video a wrap. So again, not the easiest install with slip fit exhausts, but it is doable. Uh, just make sure that you got enough strength and enough hands to do it and then make sure that your parts actually fit unfortunately like i said we had to modify it a little bit but it's working for now but with the performance shop i do have a an appointment uh on april 1st that i can go back and he can get it up on the lift and we might actually even weld every single one of them and turn this thing into a full one piece just like the factory exhaust is so if it's got to come off one day, I guess it'll just come off, I think no different than the factory. Uh, it'd just be a lot easier to remove those upper clamps there and there. So because that hinge is facing backwards or the uh, exhaust mounts, and once those are off, I think it slides out a little bit easier. But that's what I got for you guys today. So wrapping it up here, if you guys like the video, need to see more, let me know in the comments. Hit up uh, Instagram on Deck of the Woods 2020 if you want a personal message us about anything. And uh, comment down below if you want to say anything about that. Till next time then, we'll see you later.